I'm animation author and historian Mindy Johnson, and welcome to the 2022 Spark Animation Festival. We are elated that you've joined, and we appreciate your continued support for the vital efforts within the wide range of programs and content here at Spark 2022. Within our Legacy and Legends track, I'm delighted to share with you another remarkable session exploring aspects of our collected animated past. It's my great pleasure to introduce author and historian Jake Friedman with a terrific presentation around his new book, Disney Revolt, who will be joined by author, animator, and anim historian Tom Cito for a lively discussion exploring one of the most historically transitional events, the 1941 animation strike. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Mindy. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, um, my name is, uh, 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 like Mindy mentioned, my name is Tom Cito, and uh, I'm an animator and a, a historian, and uh, I teach at the University of Southern California. And uh, 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 when I began my career, uh, a lot of golden age artists were ending their careers. And so I had a little bit of an overlap in the 1970s. And one of the things I used to notice when I was at that age was this sort of animus or this sort of thing underneath the underneath the surface between a lot of these old animators based on what they did in 1941 you know like i was talking with maurice noble you know the great chuck jones designer and uh, and i and we were hanging out and i said you know maurice come on over to the disney lot we'll have lunch you know like we'll get together i'll get a lot of your old students your proteges and uh, and maurice would go no nah, i might run into frank thomas hmm. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I thought about it later. I said, what is this thing that, that these men, uh, these people are in their eighties, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're at the end of their lives and they're still angry about, uh, about what they did in that one summer of 1941. So it became a fascinating subject to try to, you know, to, to look into about this big event, uh, you know, that a lot of film history books really didn't want to talk about, you know, they just wanted to keep like uncle Walt had a happy, happy go lucky family and everybody lived on ambrosia and, uh, you know, just like you all do in animation today. Uh, so anyway, so to, to, to get into this, uh, my dear friend Jake Friedman is a historian and, and, and artist himself, um, has written a, a great comprehensive book about this very traumatic event, uh, which, you know, we call the Civil War of Animation. So uh, um, without any further ado, I'm going to let Jake take over. So, Jake, go ahead. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm going to do a little quick of a screen share here, okay? So here we go. Just bear with me for a moment. Um, so, as Tom so eloquently introduced me and so generously said, I uh, am the writer of this book, The Disney Revolt, and I started out as an animator, but I'm going to take this time to tell you how I got involved in such an undertaking and how this sort of came into what ended up being a 14-year project for me. Um, so this book, The Disney Revolt, is the story of the labor strike that almost broke the Disney studio and the animator who led that strike, and his name was Art Babbitt. And we all know Walt Disney. In the book, Walt Disney is a very major character, obviously, and there's a quite a lot of him in the book. So I'm going to take this time to tell you a little bit about Art Babbitt and a couple of the other characters in this book. So Babbitt's name might not be as famous as the animators that Walt called his nine old men, but Babbitt's role in the history of Disney animation uh, is actually pretty monumental and has never fully been brought to light until now. So why write a book about the strike in the first place? And like, how did this project even come about? And why Art Babbitt? So I've been into animation history since I was like 12 years old. And I knew the name Art Babbitt. I knew it as one of Walt's animators of the golden age. And if you look at this picture, there he is, the bottom left, eating their Mickey Mouse ice cream, Babbitt at the bottom left, and of course, Walt in the center. And here he is, one among many, on the lower left-hand corner. And as he progressed at the Disney studio, he climbed his way rather quickly into Walt's 
uh, inner circle of artists. Here he is playing with some penguins for a photo shoot on the far right. And I kind of knew he was involved in the strike, but I didn't really know to like what that meant exactly. And actually there wasn't any clear document that followed like a day by day path of the strike or a week by week path of what led up to the strike. I really wanted to get down into the nitty gritty to find out how he started out so big and ended up kind of like as a, as, as kind of a forgotten artist at Disney. Um, and so how this turned into this, this huge undertaking in the summer of 1941. Uh, so flashback to October 25th, 2007. Uh, I can tell you that's the exact date because that's the timestamp on the photo that this was taken. Uh, on the left is John Colhane. He was my animation history instructor at NYU Film School. And this photo was taken a couple years after I graduated when he invited me to speak to his students. And I presented a video and I had a Q&A session about my experience working in animation at that time when I had a couple TV shows under my belt. Both were here in New York where I live. And, and when I sat down, John said to everyone that Jake Friedman would be writing the biography of Art Babbitt. And that was the first I'd heard of it. So let me give you a little background on John Colhane. He had been an animation historian for years. Here he is throughout the years talking about Disney history with enthusiasm and gusto. Um, he had been snooping around the Disney studio since the 70s up through the 2000s. And that's why he was caricatured in The Rescuers as a character named Mr. Snoops. And again, in 2000, as the character named Flying John in Rhapsody in Blue. He also created the first history of animation course at SVA, School of Visual Arts in New York. And he had written three really cool books on behind the scenes stuff of Disney animated features on Fantasia, Aladdin, and Fantasia 2000. And that Aladdin book was the, or at least one of the first books of animation on the subject of the making of animation that I'd ever owned when it was given to me in 1992, when I was just a wee wheeling. So when I took his course, I was really struck by his thirst for joy and his excitement about the world. He was in his 60s at the time, but he acted like an awestruck kid, like a big fanboy for whom the world never lost its luster. And I volunteered to TA his class every year until I graduated. And he was just the embodiment of joy and of paying tribute to the people who brought him joy. But when he told me I was going to write the book on Babbitt, I was kind of terrified. I knew that Babbitt had done all of these monumental things as an animator. I knew he did like Snow White's Wicked Queen and that he had done Geppetto and Pinocchio and the mushrooms in Fantasia and Mr. Stork and Dumbo. And I knew that he had a hand in this cartoon short called The Country Cousin, where he animated a drunken mouse. And I knew that he was somehow responsible for Goofy, didn't really quite understand to what degree, but I knew he was, he had his stamp in the golden age of Disney, like so many other animators did. And that was pretty much it, as far as I knew, at, especially at Disney. After Disney, I knew that he was an animation teacher at the Richard Williams studio, and that was the studio that eventually ended up doing Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So John Culhane gave me the phone number of Art Babbitt's widow named Barbara Perry Babbitt out in Hollywood. And I called her and I had a cursory interview, but really I thought there's no way I'm qualified remotely to write this book on her husband. And I also had like an actual life to live, you know? And then about a year later, I got a voicemail from Barbara and this was in early August, 2009. She told me that Dina Babbitt, Art Babbitt's previous wife had just died. And she named a couple other people close to Art Babbitt who also just died, like animator Bill Melendez. And Barbara said to me bluntly, kindly, but bluntly, dear, if you want to do this, you better do it while I'm still here. You know, gulp. So I flew to Hollywood to meet her. 
And she has this really, you know, really cute house in, at the time next to the Hollywood Bowl. And I met with Barbara Babbitt. She was so nice. And I began a friendship that lasted about 10 years with her until, until her, her passing a few years ago. This photo is from around 2012, 2013. But she had this storage area that was filled with decades of relics from her life and from Art's life, from Art Babbitt's life. She gave me full access to the house. I dug through the storage room. There were filing cabinets filled with documents and photos and audio interviews. And there were home movies and tapes of canceled projects and handwritten notes by Art Babbitt himself. And going through these, I began to sort of understand him kind of intimately. And each time I went back year after year, I would visit her and dig in her records. And when I think about it now, like what got me going back year after year, you know, buying a ticket, driving a rental car, and I hate driving, especially in Southern California, no offense to Southern Californians. And just spending like an entire day in a little storage facility that had no windows and just fascinated. Like I was going through King Tut's tomb. I started to feel that it was really unjust and unfair that Art Babbitt was left out of history. And something had to be done to set this right and no one else was going to do it but me. One reason why I, I wanted to do it was because I always loved Disney. Here, here's me back in 1983. And like a gazillion of other kids, I grew up with Disney. I still love Disney. I also grew up with this. This newspaper is from 1973 and it kind of got preserved in our family like an heirloom. It's the front page of the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin where I grew up. And this was while my parents were uh, striking. They had gone out on strike in the Philadelphia teacher strike. My dad, my mom, and my grandmother were all Philadelphia school teachers who walked the picket line back in 1973. And all three of them were arrested for it. And of course, I was able to track down the photo. And that's my dad in the glasses and beard being taken away from a paddy wagon to the local precinct to serve his time for going on strike. So the more I learned about Babbitt, the more I sort of identified with him. I kind of saw him as everything that I was, but more so. He was an animator and I was an animator. Here's a brief page of like my IMDB list. He was like a big animator and I just had a few small credits. I was an educator and he fought for education for animators across you know, across the years. I was an activist and he led a labor strike. Again, he was everything that I kind of felt, but more so. So I also understand firsthand, because I was an animator, what it's like for animators to work long hours, to feel underappreciated, underrepresented. And so I dug in, I began to get a sense of who Art Babbitt was. So I wanted to share some of that with you first, take you into the storage facility and uncover who he was as a person, the man who influenced Disney and led the strike. Art Babbitt grew up in the Midwest, moved to New York in 1924 when he was 16, went to Disney in 1932 in his early 20s. And here he is talking about meeting Walt Disney for the first time. He wasn't expecting me at all. And in fact, I had a round trip ticket because I had no faith in myself. I just had $40 in spending money that was going to last me until I got back to New York. Well, and that was it, you know, seeing Disney, you know. And Disney said that, uh, first of all, and they had a full complement of artists, they couldn't afford to hire me. So I squelched that by telling him that I didn't want any money. You know, I was willing to work for three months for nothing. At the end of that time, he would either pay me what I was worth or he could fire me. He said, well, he didn't have any room for me. And I told him I only take up a space about four feet by six feet. And uh, I'm sure they could squeeze me in someplace. And as 
I was leaving his office, I said, please show me the courtesy of not throwing my name and address in the wastebasket before I slammed the door. But the next day, I did get a call to come in and go to work. So he was the same cohort as some of those old classic animators. Freddie Moore is seen in both of these photos. And Freddie Moore, as so many people know, was not only uh, kind of the person who set the style and appeal of Disney animation for that whole era, but he was also the specialist for Mickey Mouse. And two of Babbitt's best friends were Les Clark, who we see on the right, who was pretty much a Minnie Mouse specialist, and Bill Titla, who we see on the left, hiding under a bed when, when Titla joined him a couple years later. Bob Babbitt and Titla lived together. These are their Christmas cards from the 30s. I like how Les Clark is being a newsie that so many of the artists were at that time. Les Clark sends greetings. So you have a Mickey specialist, a mini specialist. Babbitt was a Goofy specialist. In this stage of Goofy's evolution, Goofy was uh, a bumbling hick. And Babbitt sort of became Goofy's father. On this model sheet, you see Babbitt's name next to animator at the bottom right. And not only is that monumental, but being a lead animator in the features also put him on top. Here's Babbitt talking about supervising the animation for Geppetto and Pinocchio. So I was directing an actor by the name of Christian Rube to do Geppetto. And I had a very subtle scene I was directing, and he would keep hamming it up, you know, exaggerating. And it was supposed to be done very quietly, very softly. And finally, he became exasperated, and there was a whole soundstage full of people watching this process. And he blew his job. He said, I have been doing this this way for 40 years. I said, fine, now we will do it correctly. But beyond being a lead animator and developing one of Disney's core characters, right? That's already big news, right? But Babbitt, I discovered, was, was incredibly significant for contributing hugely to animation as an art form at Disney. In 1932, he developed the art school at Disney. In 1934, he brought character analysis to Disney into animation as a whole. In 1936, he developed an animation technique uh, called breaking the joints, previously never considered. And in 1936, he brought live action reference to animation. The art school. So Babbitt came from New York. He had studied art in New York in places like the Art Students League. And he was familiar with how life drawing classes worked. He started holding some in his house with nude models. Uh, he did this a couple of times and it attracted a lot of Disney animators. Walt got wind of this and pulled the art aside and said that it would look bad for the Disney company for nude models to go into individual animators' houses. How about we host the art classes here at the, at the studio? And Babbitt said, great. So Babbitt not only brought art classes there, but he brought the teacher, Don Graham, which was over at Chenard's, now called CalArts. This photo is of Don Graham leading an art class at the Disney studio. The building across the street from the Disney studio on Hyperion Avenue was called the Annex. And the Annex was where these art classes were held. And Don Graham, was, he, he was kind of one of the guys, one of uh, the cohort of jokesters. And they placed this, this banner above the entryway called the Don Graham Memorial Institute, you know, Memorial being a gag because Don Graham was not dead. He's standing right there. And uh, the motto, Semper Gluteus Maximus, they translated it as always your ass. Character analysis. 
So Babbitt was inspired by this new fad going around Hollywood called method acting. And people were picking up books by Stanislavski and Boleslavski about how to get into the mind of a character. Um, I had read some memos from the Disney studio at the time. And in all of them, the directors and Walt were all looking for the keys to personality. They always asked for ideas that would somehow give the characters more personality. Personality, personality, personality. The word kept showing up, but no one seemed to really know how to get it. And the gag ideas and story ideas were very action heavy. They weren't very character heavy. So Babbitt buckled down in 1934 and typed this up, the character analysis of the goof. He'd already animated Goofy. He decided to get into Goofy's psyche, which was crazy at the time. He was a cartoon character. He was a drawing on paper. But he decided to write three pages discussing this cartoon character's psyche and internal motivations. It rocked the studio. It became the key to unlock personality. And here's a tiny part of a way in which research into the Babbitt family and personal archives came in handy. So one thing within that character analysis says, as Babbitt put it, in, in describing Goofy, he is a philosopher of the barbershop variety. Well, okay, that's very quaint, but what does that mean? In Babbitt's diary, he quotes his old New York City barber saying, his Italian barber saying, death, She's a not such a bad a thing in life. And that, I think, encapsulates the way in which Babbitt took what he knew and applied it to this art form. And there was no way I could have discovered this had it not been for access that Barbara Babbitt had given me. In 1936, Babbitt developed an animation technique called, as I said, breaking the joints. So this technique went against every instinct the animators had. And it became a physical language into character. But I'll let Art explain it for us. One thing about the character Goofy is the fact that he walks in an impossible manner. Being an iconoclast, I took all the rules of animation and broke them. Did everything wrong I possibly could. And it's better than if you do it right. So let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> so if you're like me, hearing him talk about this, maybe helping you get a little bit of a taste of who this man was. The final thing that I wanted to bring about in just this section is how Babbitt used live action reference for his animation. Now mind you, rotoscoping was done, like tracing uh, live action footage, but never using live action footage to imply animation, never, never letting it kind of inform the animation and kind of like using it as a means to caricature. So here's some of Babbitt's actual footage against some of his animation. Of course, Babbitt was not a baton twirler. He was not a majorette. He needed to find someone who was an expert in these things. And so he did. The idea of finding someone who was an expert in this to inform the animation was used thusly in Snow White. And here he is talking about being the first person to shoot reference for an animated feature film and beyond. This is Marge Belcher, who played the part of Snow White, and I shot it with my own 16 millimeter camera on the sound stage of the old studio on Hyperion Avenue. He um, also used the camera for setting. He got some of the box things for the goofy character. Uh, many different things he photographed in the setting afterwards. And like the art class, and he won't pick up on and said, hey, we ought to get the best in the studio and have everybody do it. So uh, everybody did do it. 
but I was the one that did the first court visit. And uh, I was the one that made things happen. So that was Frank Thomas, one of Walt's nine old men at Art Babbitt's uh, memorial in 1992, and one of the greats of animation. He and the others knew that Babbitt's innovations were instrumental in Disney animation success, and without them, we wouldn't have Snow White. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to take... Oh, I'm... How's how's the how's the the audio the uh, what do you call it? How's the background noise holding up for everyone? Because I have a window open. There's occasionally yeah, I hear, I hear a car. car that runs by, but um, I think this latest instance was the only thing that had been noticed. The other, what can you put a blind down so you don't have the uh, uneven lighting? What do you think, Jake? Oh, look at that. Yeah, it looks like. That's probably the more apparent thing. Yeah, yeah. Is that brand new? Did this just happen? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, so now you got more controlled lighting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> That's okay. Wanna, okay, so you want to introduce this slide again? Sure, sure. Okay. Take two. Okay. Uh, so here we have. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple minutes of this newsreel. Not the whole thing. You can watch it on your own online. It's all over the internet, I'm sure. But this is a newsreel about Snow White. And I want you to mm, take careful notice, listen very carefully. And remember, this was released in 1937, nine years after Steamboat Willie. It's the culmination of progress of this new art form. So listen and, and watch. From Hollywood comes the most exciting motion picture news of 1938. Walt Disney has completed and released his first full-length feature production, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, in Technicolor, the most daring adventure in screen entertainment since the birth of the motion picture. As its credit titles, longest in cinema history, flash across the nation's screens, audiences for the first time realize the tremendous amount of manpower required for the production of this epoch-making animated picture. The entirely new form of storytelling that already has captivated every man, woman, and child who has seen it. Just how was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs created? And how are the famous Disney short films made? To give you the answer, we take you behind the closed doors of the famed Walt Disney Studio in Hollywood. Doors usually barred to all visitors. During the past three years, the studio staff has grown from less than 300 to more than 700 artists and musicians. They worked in shifts, night and day, to complete this unique experiment in entertainment. Remember as a kid how you made your own movies by drawing little figures on the pages of a pen and flipping the pages to make the figures move? That's the basic principle behind animated pictures today. Okay. Did you notice how often the artists were working according to that announcer, right? If you were paying close attention, the, the announcer said night and day, which was actually uh, absolutely true. The artists were working night and day to finish this film on time. And Walt thanked them on the title card for not only their hard work, but also their loyalty. And I found that to be a pretty significant piece of what really inspired Walt. I found more about Babbitt and the strike at a couple of key archives. One was at the John Kameyer collection at the NYU Bopes Library in New York. There were interviews from the 1970s with Babbitt and people who knew him, and documents and cool copies and Xeroxes going back to the 1930s. I went there countless times, and the final time I was leaving, there was a huge crowd with protest signs a block away. What was going on? It was the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which was a tragically preventable event that caused the deaths of 146 garment workers in New York City because of unfair working conditions. The factory is now an NYU building that's just 50 feet away from the library. And this event, the burning of the building, is an event that was a turning point for a lot of activists for workers' rights. 
I just kind of found that interesting at the time and still do. Sometime around this time, I started a blog to organize my research and to motivate myself to keep going. And I called it Babbit Blog. It's still up. When I came to the strike, I needed more. So Tom Cito's book was a great start. But Tom only put one chapter on the strike in the book. And I wanted to see what happened in a day-by-day -day, like calendar read of the strike. A helpful lead was in the book. There were some source credits, like the Southern California University, SCU. So I spent several days in this archive, the SCU Northridge Oviatt Library archive. It's the home to the Screen Cartoon Guild collection. And there are original flyers and bulletins of the Disney strike. And so I was now reading exactly what the unionists were reading before and during the Disney strike. Flyers like these that were meant to motivate people from within the union and outside the union. And bulletins like these. The bulletin on the left is one of many, a daily bulletin that the strikers got called On the Line. And on the bottom corner there, in every issue, there's a cartoon caricaturing Walt and his crony named Gunny. More on that later. It took about seven years to get this far from when I started. So it's now like 2015. I've been researching the strike as far as the internet will take me, but in uh, in, in, in the Babbitt home was a document that was a Xerox of a law book of labor disputes. And it was the National Labor Relations Board versus Walt Disney Productions. And it gave a citation that I couldn't locate. There was one that I had that was about 20 pages long, a summary. But this citation was from the US Circuit Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit Court and it had an appeal number. So I tracked it down to the National Archives of San Francisco, which is the house and of the, uh, excuse me, to the, to the National Archives of San Francisco, which is the home to the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit Court. And I thought this was strange. I discovered that the archives for the US Court of Appeals is way out west for some reason. So I asked a friend, named Lucas Seastrom, who at the time worked at the Walt Disney Family Museum, to go over there and uh, look up this archive and let me know what he finds. And then, like, he does, and he sends me an email, and he says, hey, uh, this is a tiny piece that I was able to scan. I'm going to have to go back. And his email is a link to a 500-page uh, document on a Google Drive. And over the course of several visits, Lucas scans uh, 1,520 pages of this court document titled National Labor Relations Board versus Walt Disney Productions, 1942. It even has Art Babbitt's name on the first page of this report. But some of the coolest stuff from the archives were preserved as pieces of evidence. Oh, I'm, I'm going to go back for one second, OK? Cut, print. Um, among those pages were 1,000 pages of testimony from artists of animation's golden age. Art Babbitt testifies for two and a half days. Disney, uh, Disney directors like Bill Roberts, Dick Lundy, Wilford Jackson, Dave Hand, directors from Warner Brothers like Chuck Jones. And of course, Walt Disney himself testifies. Walt Disney actually was so stressed out on the stand that he started to break down and cry. And the trial had to break for a short recess so it could continue. And uh, if you're wondering what Walt says in the testimony, he's 100% in alignment with everything else that I found. There's the page one of Walt's testimony. And that was pretty cool. But some of the coolest stuff from the archives that I found were preserved pieces of evidence that were submitted from both sides. It was a peek into Disney's golden age, which is my favorite period of animation. There were animation drawings, sweatbox notes for animation tests, storyboard panels, model sheets. Here on the left, we have a uh, 
a program for the theater where Pinocchio premiered. Over here we have uh, in the center Art Babbitt's contract in 1936. Every couple of years he got a new contract. But most importantly, I found something I found nowhere else. There were transcripts of meetings, word for word, that were actually held at the Disney studio. So this is the first page of a word for word transcript of a meeting during the making of Snow White. And director Dave Hand with Purse Pierce is frustrated that Babbitt is animating extra footage. This was submitted as evidence that Babbitt was not a valued member of the Disney team. Babbitt's habit was to animate it until it felt right and to kind of ignore the time limitations. So this is really cool <laughs> that you're able to read these words like you're a fly on the wall. I found some actors and a director and I was able to reenact that transcript. I want to share that with you right now. This is 1937, a few months away from the release date of Snow White. Here's what I think. I'm quite open with you. I think you are going off in your corner and taking it upon yourself to present something in the sweat box which is entirely out of line or away from what we as directors have tried to follow through from the story conferences into the sweat box. We try to give each animator the stuff the right way. Work it all out with him so that when he leaves the room, we like to feel it is pretty much set as far as our mentality can go. Walt is above us in that, but we do the best we can. The reason I'm bringing this up is because of the trouble we are having with your scenes. As I have said, I feel that you are going off and working things out as if, say, you were superior to the three of us working together and agreeing on one way of handling it. So I'm going to pick out one scene in particular. It is a... Uh, is that scene of the door slam off stage and the tape and the up with the picks and the shush. And here's my angle. We spent a lot of time with you, which we should do. It is our duty to do it in order to get the scene right. You spared nothing. We acted it out, timed it with a stopwatch. Had you agreed to what we were talking about before you left the room, or we wouldn't have let you leave. When you present it in the sweat box, you have added footage without permission. You have not done the scene the way we say it. You want to see the scene the way we laid it out. I did it just that way. Then it is your duty to come back and tell us that we are not doing it right. You've got to work with us to give us the kind of stuff we want and the kind of stuff we're trying to follow through from Walt's angle. There's nothing personal in this. You've got to work with us or work by yourself. I can't work with you this way. There's something happening here. I feel I'm responsible for it. I'm saying it now try and catch it. If there's something we're doing wrong with you first, want to correct it. We're not having that trouble with the other animators. But let me say this, that in working with a dozen animators and having trouble with one, I assume it is the one who is wrong. Now, you talk, Art. In the first place, you're wrong in assuming that anybody is trying to get off in a corner by himself. That is the way I've always worked. When I see a thing and I know it is wrong, I tried to make a stab at making it right. But in this instance, I tried to explain, and I'm not making excuses, that these things weren't satisfactory to me, but I had to get them in. I came in after the scene and been lying around for three days and they hadn't shot them yet. And if you needed more time, you should have come back and gotten it, not misinterpreted the scene. It occurs in other scenes too. I will go up and get the exposure sheets and the test we did. We want to do that, but that has nothing to do with the point we are making. I have worked with a group of animators and directors and I see a condition that needs to be remedied. It is a bad condition, an unhealthy condition with one animator. Whose fault it is, we will find out but we must correct the condition. That is my thing. I bring it up directly to the animator in order to work out the differences and clear it up so you can be productive. Don't get the misunderstanding that anybody is working against you. The blame lies right with myself. I would like to say it wasn't my work, but that, it so happened that is the result got. I've done a lousy job, and I wanted to try to fix it. You tell me you know I can direct, and I say I know you can animate. 
You mustn't go down on the drawing board and go against direction without consulting with us. If you do, then there is a loss because you've not talked it over the new way. If you have a new way, you should come back and talk it over and convince us that the new way is better. Then we are working in unison. You feel it in any place else except the one scene. Yes, and the scene following that, uh, the uh, extra nods and the turn and the extra time we allowed you in there. We allowed that to you on your own recommendation that you would prove it successful, which you haven't done. You meant the nod. The extra time and not getting anywhere. Smiles, nods at audience and turns around. Also, the goose take he makes in there was not discussed. The, the, the goose, I remember when it came, he was to turn around and come up with his hands in back of him. Instead of that, he was apparently added the footage of a big stiff take, and then he goes into his goose, which to me spoils the action. No, no, no. Will you let me get back to something else? That other scene with the door slam off stage and the take into Up With The Picks and the shush. I remember saying to you that the shortness and quickness or speed of the scene were what made the comedy. I heard the same words from Walt this morning, exactly what we told you. When I hear Walt speaking the words that we have spoken, well, a mistake is being made, and I don't like it for the sake of I have the test, and I will show it to you. I animated it in exactly the time allotted. This seemed to me the obvious thing to try for in fixing it. We went over it eight or ten times with the stopwatch and put it on the sheets. I say directly that you didn't animate it properly, and that is my argument here. You are wasting time. We need badly to finish the picture. We want every foot of yours we can get in the picture. Well, I think I, I don't care what you think. I feel that what we are saying is right and that you should think about it. There's nothing personal in it. In fact, I'm trying to help you. I could go to Walt and say, this is just no good. Get him off the picture. My object is to line you up so that you can move the stuff through and help you so that you can move it through properly. I like to give an animator freedom on the scene, but now we find that you are making mistakes in your direction. You mustn't go off in a corner. You mustn't use some of your own ideas without talking them over with us. We will drop it now. Anything we can do from our end of it to help you or to change our ways of working with you, we want to do it and we'll be glad to do it. Think it over. Come back and let us know what we can do to help you. Well, you might animate it for me. First, would you like to add anything to what I have said or soften it or anything? I think this art... And this is just one man's reaction, looking at a lot of dopies from different animators. That it would be a good idea if you were to accept Dopey as he is more or less being consistently visualized by everybody else. Now, I'm talking about his face now. I think that it would be better for you to take him as he is rather than to explore a different face, which would mean a different personality. I think this would help move us along and think it would help you move along much faster. That is perfectly swell. In other words, I like Fred's Dopey and what other people have done with Fred's Dopey better than your Dopey. I was told to explore and that is what I did. That is perfectly true. I agree with first that we should advise you now to stop the exploring and get down to where you can really turn out some footage. If you like, I will ask Walt for an okay of that if there's still confusion in your mind. And maybe Walt doesn't agree. If Walt says he wants a middle-aged man. Then somebody else whispers in my ear he means boyish. Boyish looking. Who whispered it? Tight love. Ham stopped me and said, you ought to make Dobie more boyish looking. Well, Fred says he ought to look like a child, a kid. Forget that angle, I think, and draw the character. I will defy anyone who puts the stamp of age on that character, the way he's being handled in both story and in animation. I think the boyish personality, but not necessarily the boyish expression. In other words, when Walt says that uh, he's 40 years old, the meaning was he mustn't be drawn as a skippy. I would like to say that the period of exploration on Dopey is past. You can hold me responsible for saying that if you like. An animator has to speculate too. If you don't speculate a lot, you won't get any place. This is just one of my great speculations, that is all. We are trying to help you make it a better speculation from now on. We sit here and look at your work from a distance and feel that what we are saying is right. Okay, I wanted to share that with you and give you a peek into the Disney studio during the golden age and immediately uh, 
afterwards, a few years later, maybe 1941, um, there's an, another conversation, and I just want to share that one too. It's a bit shorter, but very powerful. Um, and all of these transcripts made their way into my research in some way or another. Here's a reenactment of a transcript from March 1941, a couple of months before the strike, between Babbitt and the head of the personnel department, who I guess we would call HR department, named Hal Adelquist. Now, keep in mind, Adelquist, the HR guy, has been one of the groomsmen at Babbitt's wedding previously, and now he's sort of like cozied up to Walt's corner. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Oh, sure. Uh, I wanted to have my secretary here for the record. Um, listen, are you ready? A few complaints regarding you personally have come to my attention. I uh, want to refer you again to Walt's memo to please carry on union activity either at lunchtime or after 5.30. It's come up that you've been going through the unit talking to the fellows. Just to prove that. There's no intention to prove anything. But when I go to the coffee shop, if I talk to anybody, I do it there. People on both sides are guilty. Dan McManus can tell you he took one and a half hours of my time last week. Yesterday, Bernie Wolf came in and spent almost an hour. And I want to call all those boys and remind them of what's I'm not taking sides. Only complaints have come to me that you personally have been going into the rooms, talking to the boys during working hours. Yes, I've done that. I don't deny it. But when I go into a room, like... Bill Tightla, I see him every day. I don't spend more than five minutes. Same with Les Clark. You understand what I mean. Both Bodel and Yeager and the Labor Board have already cautioned me, so I'm being very careful. If the boys do drop into your room during company time, I would appreciate your telling them to make it after business hours. Right now, but... We're in such a condition right now that the thing we need is production. We need it so badly that if we don't get it, there won't be any unions. And the more time you take from the man who should be contributing work is bad. Well, we don't want to discontinue the coffee shop and those privileges, but if we don't get out the work, we're going to have to. If it was someone else from the other union, I would tell him the same thing and ask him to be fair and honest. I, I, I have no excuse for myself, but... I'm more or less in the position where I'm under scrutiny by everybody. Anyone who's not on my side is bound to criticize if me. If fellows on your respective sides could only agree that working time here at the studio should be consumed in working, and any other discussion should, should be after hours. But we have the right to say that since we are paying a man for a particular type of work, we have the right to expect work for it. I've tried to cooperate. I have talked at the union meetings about it, and I have to prove by actions what my feelings are. It's only a question of time. Well, that I'm very neutral. What I want to talk to you about was that I would appreciate you fellows cooperating with Walt. It's the one thing he asked for, for the men to give him a fair deal. He doesn't care what happens off the lot. Yeah, I'm inclined to believe he doesn't give a damn what happens off the lot. You know, we've noticed that your work on Dumbo, on the store itself. Oh, is that, I know that things are taking longer than we had anticipated, but that has nothing to do with union talk or otherwise. I'm simply trying to get the best work possible, like I always do. <clears throat> there have been complaints that you personally have solicited for unions during company hours and have been taking other people's time. That's true. I just wanted to caution you about it. I'm only asking for your sense of fair play on the thing. If fellows do come into your room, tell them that you're busy, but we'd be happy to talk to them on your own time. I would tell the same thing to the opposing interest. Thank you, that's all. So I soon found that I could tell the story about Babbitt and the strike with mainly sources from that time, like quotes and documents. And I didn't really need to rely on interviews of pe people that happened like 30, 40 years later. And I found that to be kind of what my new goal was. I read and annotated this 1500 page document. I took my laptop everywhere from <laughs> country to continent, from one side of this country to the other side of this country. On every trip I was on, I was always working on airports or airplanes on this thing. And I kind of pieced together what this document said the strike was all about. 
And I learned the inner workings of the Disney studio from diaries and letters. I immersed myself in the research about the people that the strikers were fighting against, which were not Walt Disney necessarily, but a Texas lawyer and a Chicago mobster. The Texas lawyer was Walt's vice president and, and his chief legal counsel, and his name was Gunther Lessing. The more I learned about Lessing, the more I started seeing him kind of like Jafar from Aladdin. He catered to Walt's stubbornness, and he sought to protect his position, his high position in the company. And he kind of pushed Walt further into opposition, into opposition. He kind of pushed Walt further into opposition with with uh, the independent union, then Walt probably would have gone on his own. Interestingly, Lessing started out as Babbitt's ally. Here, the two of them are sitting at a dinner with Les Clark and Les's wife and Art's wife, Marge, who was mo the model for Snow White. Uh, so although they were kind of close and tight in the 30s and into 19, really until 1938, once union talk started really gripping the studio, Lessing began being seen by the unionists as the man standing in the way of union representation. And once the strike began, he was considered the mastermind holding back a resolution. Here's a clip, a couple moments of the strike from home movies at that time. And this effigy is an effigy of Gunther Lessing. Here's a caricature of Gunther Lessing. Here's a drawing of Gunther Lessing. I'd mentioned these drawings at the bottom of the Strikers Bulletin. In this cartoon, he's called Gunny. He's wearing this sombrero because he had been a lawyer in Mexico for Pancho Villa. And he always has flies buzzing around his head and he's always wearing long underwear. But he's always beside Walt in these caricatures. Later on in his later years, Babbitt would say, I think of all the lousy things that happened during the strike and afterwards, I would say that 50% of it was caused by outside influences, namely Gunther Lessing and a guy by the name of O'Rourke. He was the labor relations guy, you know. And even people inside, like Ward Kimball, wrote in a letter when asked, how do you feel the settlement could have been speeded up? He writes, by Gunther Lessing's early demise, he hated unions and brainwashed 50% Walt, I think. So that's the Texas lawyer. Chicago mobster, Willie Byoff, a member of the Al Capone gang. Willie Byoff was a racketeer a crooked union leader in Hollywood. And he had the idea to blackmail studio heads and threatened to put their workers out on strike if the studio heads didn't pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars. This isn't adjusted for inflation. This is like $500,000 in 1938. So from 1937 through 1940, Babbitt and Walt were both fighting Willie Byoff together. And then the Disney strike happened. And five weeks into the Disney strike, this happened. Walt aligned with Bioff. So this story about the strike now involves a nefarious Vizier and the mafia. And after a conversation with fellow author Mindy Aloff, I realized that this was the juicy story worth telling. Not a biography of Art Babbitt, but a story about the strike. And in 2019, I reshaped my book, so it was a story about the events that led up to and during the strike. In, 2019, in December 2019, my publisher, Chicago Review Press, bought it. Uh, my final draft was 120,000 words. I was only allowed 80,000 words. So what you're reading when you read the book is about two thirds of the original draft. And um, it was heartbreaking editing that book, but in the end, I hope to have something that was not just for animation aficionados, but also something that average people interested in Americana or Hollywood history or an underdog story could enjoy.
I'm going to conclude by reading a bit more. Well, I'm going to conclude by reading a bit from the prologue that I had written in the book. Uh, the strike erupted during an already tumultuous time. It was the summer of 1941 when World War II was ravaging Europe and America's involvement looked imminent. The Disney studio had been at odds with an independent animators union for several months with Babbitt representing the union. The singular moment that ripped them apart can be pinpointed to the early evening of Friday, June 13th, 1941. It was a warm afternoon in Burbank, California. Inside the Disney studio on Buena Vista Street, animators, inkers, and painters sat at their desks making renderings of Dumbo and Bambi. There were many empty desks around them. The missing Disney artists had been on strike for nearly three weeks. The strikers and non-strikers saw each other every morning and evening as the scabs drove through the picket line and the unionists yelled epithets. The strikers drew Disney characters on the picket signs and leaflets. It was a media circus. When the pickets gathered outside the studio at quitting time, they learned too late that they had been hoodwinked. The non-strikers had left the lot shortly before to reconvene for a staff meeting at a high school auditorium a few blocks away. In haste, the strikers relocated to the high school, led by Babbitt, five foot ten, blonde and steely-eyed. When the strikers finally arrived, most of the non-strikers had already gone home. Except for a handful of allies, only Walt Disney himself remained, sitting in his blue Packard convertible, tipping his hat at the many strikers in the confident style of President Roosevelt. Out of the rabble rushed Art Babbitt, and he ran to the strikers' amplified microphone. Babbitt looked directly at his employer. Walt Disney, he yelled. You ought to be ashamed. He yelled it again, more emphatically, the amplified words echoing. Walt stopped the car. His expression had changed. After months of agitation from Babbitt, something primal had uncharacteristically took over. Walt Disney leapt from the vehicle and stormed toward Babbitt. Stunned onlookers watched as the space between Walt and Babbitt rapidly closed. Cheering and booing filled the air. Babbitt had shattered Walt's last nerve, and the two were headed to a final showdown. This is me. I've been Jake Friedman, talking to you about the Disney Revolt, my book about Art Babbitt, Walt Disney, and the Disney Strike. Hope you liked it. Jake, so great. So, um, uh, uh, one of the things I was curious about is that, you know, one of the problems that I always have as a historian is um, people in uh, today's day and age would say, yeah, well, that's that's interesting what happened back in the 40s. But what does that have to do with me? Like, what's what? Why is this relevant? You know, so so what do you think the message is of of uh, uh, of the Disney revolt to uh, to, to a modern audience, uh, a modern animation or, um, artist? Well, listen, there's always, there's always a need for, for representation. People, especially now, seem to be valuing their working conditions and their rights as workers in a way that we hadn't really seen. We have the strength of unions coming up all over Hollywood, particularly in animation. I seem to understand that affects artists as well are starting to value the power that they get within unions. Um, and folks in animation production. I think that generally, whenever a group of, of artists or laborers or craftspeople or anyone, anyone who's marginalized find that their, their basic rights are being infringed upon, they deserve the power and freedom to gather and rise up and be represented and to have those basic needs met. I think it goes beyond just workers' rights, although that's very important. I think it's whenever you have any basic right that you feel is being squelched, you need to gather and voice that and fight for it. This, by the way, the Disney strike was successful. I don't mind spoiling that because I think that's the point of the story, that they won. The strikers won. They became a union shop. And the Disney studio 
has been an animation union shop ever since. That's true. That's true. Um, I know that in, in, in Vancouver specifically, uh, uh, we, uh, which was the animation guilds. Well, well, there is a, there is a, a, a IA guild in, in, uh, an IA union in, in Vancouver, I believe it's a 891. And, and, um, uh, in the 1990s, when I was president, I remember we tried several organizing efforts in Canada and uh, specifically in Vancouver. And it was always a little difficult because uh, one of the things the employers would say is, well, all these Americans are coming up here to talk about unions because th they want to make it so that it gets so expensive that, that you know, that, that they'll take the jobs back to Hollywood. So they'll, they'll, they'll take them away, you know? So what do you, what do you think is, uh, you know, and, and we would always try to say like, no, this is your union i mean you organize it you know we won't have anything to do with it it'll be it'll be the vancouver union but what do you think is uh, you know would be would be a message uh you know what do you think babbitt would say or something to to uh, artists specifically in vancouver in vancouver in response to that babbitt well babbitt was very stubborn babbitt, babbitt didn't miss words either and he didn't yeah. suffer fools lightly did, yeah. did he know art babbitt i think you knew him personally didn't you yeah i did i did yeah yeah so, yeah, I, I know he used to say he used to say uh, 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 part of Walt Disney's success was he had the innate bad taste of the American public. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was a terrific gambler, he would say, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, one of the, one of the other things too, that, that's, that, that I noticed too, when I was doing my own research is that people who tend to focus on Disney research always have this idea of Disney, like, like being a world of its own, like a, the magic, the magic kingdom, you know, it's always the magic kingdom. And, and, and when you read the artists and stuff, they're all part of the film community, just like, you know, like we're all friends now, like we all know each other and we all talk to each other and stuff. And it was the same thing back then. I mean, um, in the footage you were showing, Chuck Jones and the Warner Brothers people with, uh, were on the picket line. You know, they didn't have to be there. They were there because they were supporting fellow artists. Yeah, yeah. All those big floats from the Disney revolt, from the Disney strike, the ones of like the, the French Revolution, yeah. or, for instance, those were built and designed by the Warner Brothers folks. Yeah. They were all contributing there. They were they were in alignment. And um, Walt wanted, the whole thing started with like a small in-studio union, like just for animators at Disney, a company union, which is, you know, unless you have the power of other companies within a craft, it doesn't really have a lot of power. And it's just sort of bogus to have an in-company union, particularly this one that was kind of co-invented by Gunther Lessing. Again, there he shows up. Um, so I think, I think maybe Walt saw that within the walls of the Disney studio, everyone was kind of, like you said, in his kingdom, in this magic kingdom. This is before the word magic kingdom became a Disney thing, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't think he understood that um, if you're going to say, Disney artists deserve this union and the other artists don't, they don't deserve that. You're talking to people who, whose friends are those other artists, whose friends are in other studios. And um, it seemed to be those, those artists who, who heard that and thought that there's something that doesn't sit right with me about that. These were the artists who saw that the industry was what needed support, not just one company. I think that's the core difference. Mm, true, true, true. Uh, oh, which, uh, you know, since, you know, we have uh, Mindy Johnson helping us out too. And, and Mindy did such a beautiful job, um, uh, did such a beautiful job uh, on her book, Ink and Paint Girls. You talk a little bit about Babbitt's uh, working also with the women in the studio and, 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 you know, and, and helping them sort of, you know, uh, raise their own union consciousness and everything. Like, how do you think like Babbitt would uh, work to, uh, in via V the 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 uh, uh, situation of ladies in the studio? There are a lot of stories that I couldn't put in the book because I wanted to limit it to just sources from those few years around the strike. There's an apocryphal story that that Babbitt witnessed 
a painter or an inker, a young lady having fainted because she was malnourished, because she couldn't afford to feed herself. Um, again, I couldn't find, I couldn't triangulate my research around that. But it was true that that inkers and painters were paid like the equivalent of like what would now be an eighteen thousand dollar a year salary or twenty thousand dollar a year salary mm -hmm. adjusted for inflation. And if you think about earning twenty thousand dollars a year working in in a Hollywood studio, that sounds that sounds so meager. Uh, and this whole staff was doing was doing just that. Walt, there was a there's a transcript. I love these transcripts that showed up in my research. There's a transcript for a meeting that a bunch of these these artists were holding. Some were pro pro union, some were questioning, and they didn't know whether to form a union or not. And Art and Bill Roberts, one of the directors, both say that Walt didn't really. He loves his animators, but he doesn't really see the hard work of the people on the lower rungs, the inkers, the painters, the assistants, the in-betweeners. He doesn't really value the people who really are stoking the fire, you know, who are doing the hard work that lets the, the engine go. Um, and if they're saying this then, in their perspective, I can only, you know, say that they had a better view on it than I do. Walt clearly valued his highest his highest talented artists, mm -hmm. animators, and story folks. Um, it's a shame, I guess, that that there was this, this such a great wage gap between the highest paid animator and the lowest paid paid painter. Yeah, yeah. I know that. The, uh, um, guys, I'm going to jump in here on this sure. one. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, no. no. What yeah. we know about our history and, and our past, um, what we know about the truth, the truth is constant, but what we know about it changes. Um, it, with regard to the women, uh, they were actually paid on a level uh, that, well, first of all, I have evidence. Uh, Jake, I pointed this out with the Betty Smith Totten collection. Her husband, Bob Totten, they were not married at the time, but he was a young in-betweener. She was actually getting paid more than he was as an inker at that point during the strike. So there is irrefutable proof that women were not necessarily at the bottom rung. Additionally, uh, women who were being paid as inkers and painters at the time, I did the comparisons to labor, they were getting paid about the same amount as, high, as an educator, as teachers were being paid in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is myth that has stayed stuck with us. And to your point, these stories that exist about a, a painter who fainted because she couldn't afford and wasn't getting paid are myths. Um, there is proof that's out there that, that changes that. And um, it, it's also important to note, too, that a uh, number of the women, Yuba, uh, later Yuba O'Brien, uh, was at the time the primary uh, money maker. She, her parents were not earning a living at that time. It was the Depression. Mm -hmm. And so for a woman working uh, at, at getting paid 13 to 15 dollars a week uh, a paycheck like that was actually um you could you could rent a smart two-bedroom apartment in hollywood for 15 dollars a, a month uh, you could buy a car for three or four hundred dollars uh, at that time so when when you place that wage in that context um, it certainly wasn't as great and grandiose as Art Babbitt was making. He was a bit of an anomaly for his level of skill and talent, of course. But when you look at the wage numbers that we have documented proof on, it is a bit different than what we think. So some of these myths, um, it's time to sort of lay them to rest. <laughs> yeah, but it is a thing too. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, Babbitt told me the story of the of the, the woman who fainted, and and uh, and uh, part of it too was that it was a common occurrence a lot of times during the Great Depression. Uh, of, uh, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the depths of the Great Depression that uh, that that a, a husband, like if you have a family and you have several children, uh, sometimes it would just get so bad that the husband would just abandon the family. And, and, oh, yeah. and apparently that was a situation I heard with this woman that she had children. She was holding down her job at the, at the studio and her husband lost his job. And, and his solution was to just walk away, you know, and, and that did happen during the great depression. And one of the other things that was mentioned too, uh, was that, was that for all the back and forth about who was right or who was wrong about the strike. Uh, once the strike was settled, the base pay of most of the staff doubled. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, so. it, it certainly did bring about much needed change and transition. But um, I think in terms of, I guess, where the point I, I want to make here is that uh, women were being paid going wages at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and to this end as well, Walt is on record as stating that if a woman can do the job, a woman gets the pay. So mm -hmm. they weren't necessarily notched down because of their gender. Um, it, at other places, absolutely, but and we're still fighting that difference today, unfortunately, for women. Uh, but there are a few things, it's important to keep these things in context and, and um, recognize that um, certainly was challenging at the height of the depression, but there were, it was an opportunity for women and particularly women as artists to be able to earn a living, um, a going wage through mm -hmm. an art form rather than being relegated to secretarial work or, uh, you know, grocery store labor or whatever minimal opportunities were there for women. Yeah, and that's why so many inkers and painters and assistants and uh, in-betweeners didn't go out on strike. Yeah. And it was kind of split down the middle. It was very close to half and half. Like, yeah, there were very, a number of- Very close. Uh, I, I know within the ink and paint ranks, there, it was a split regard um, I, at the day that the strike or the day before the strike occurred, uh, the department heads stood outside and said, good night to everyone, you know, assuring them, you know, we'll see you tomorrow. But yet a number of them uh, did not return. Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah. I remember, I, I remember Bill Melendez telling me and Bill was an assistant at that time. And, 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 and he said, uh, you know, he said he found that a, a little annoying that he said that, that uh, when he saw ink and paint people going back to work, crossing the line, he says, he says, well, we're striking for them and they're going back to work. What is this? <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, it, it, everybody had to make their own decision Yeah. about, uh, you, you know, it's one thing to rhetorically talk about, the political problems of the day, the socioeconomic problems of the day. But then when you got to put it down to eating or not, you know, <laughs> you know it's like, okay, this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, theoretical anymore. This is real. You know, like you're going to be unemployed during the great depression, you know, exactly. or. Right. And to right. your point you brought up earlier, Tom, uh, a lot of the women were left to run the households and take care of the children in addition mm -hmm. to working. Uh, mm -hmm. And or, you know, the men of the family were uh, the first to be unemployed. So it was up to the women to sort of pick up, up the pieces. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, it's, it, it, you know, it's that domestic thing, too, about uh, this little side. But uh, but I remember like years ago, back in the 70s and, and everything, having of some friends that were sort of very old fashioned. And, and, and one guy, his wife was actually an assistant bank manager. And, and 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 he'd been laid off from the studio and 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 anyway so so uh he would go home and she would still shop and make dinner for him yeah <laughs> and it's like or uneven go oh, cook something what's wrong with you yeah after she worked <laughs> the longer day at the office um yeah. you know and betty smith taunton is a terrific example when you examine the strike too she uh her father had died and she was 17 in high school in her senior, about to start her senior year. Her mother was a Canadian citizen and had a younger uh, son yet at home to raise. So the, uh, the community rallied and, and they got Betty a job. And at 17, she became the breadwinner for the household. Mm -hmm. um, when the strike came about, it was she was really torn. She went out on strike because of Bob. But she regretted that. Uh, and I think secretly Bob did as well. 
according to the family. Um, but she was at the time making more money than Bob was as an inker and getting a job. She had worked briefly at a, a bank for a while or at a hardware store initially, and then getting this job at Disney doubled her wages and provided an, you know, a, a much more comfortable environment for her to be working in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to be uh, in a, a safe, clean, comfortable realm was also key. Conditions changed, though, prior to the strike with the transition to the studio. Um, and, you know, there were also lingering feelings of a lack of, of perhaps bonus pay from Snow White. Talk about that yeah, a little yeah. bit and how that played into it. Yeah, this is a discussion. Uh, yeah, this is something we were going to bring up uh, uh, again, too, was the idea of um, uh, uh, there was an issue of bonus pays, particularly after Snow White, because Snow White was like a huge success when it came out. Like it wasn't it wasn't just a movie did well. The movie was like Star Wars or something. It, 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 it was like the top box office earner of 1938. And there was a lot of talk about bonuses. And 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 again, this is another thing, too, that a lot of historians, you know, because they'll they'll read one side or another side. They go, oh, the, oh, they were bonuses. The bonuses were paid. Or they weren't paid. Jake, like, what did, what did you find on, on, on the bonus issue? You know, it's funny. Like, this bonus thing was such a big part of the golden age of Disney. And even in, like, Disney published books, like Frank and Ollie's The Illusion of Life, it references the, the bonus plan. And I think it calls it the bonus fiasco. But it, mm. it just comes and it goes, and it's easy to miss. But it's there. And I was able to, to find some documents about it and, and see that there was this profit sharing plan, which sounds great. Started in 1930, 1934, 35. And uh, Walt and Roy wanted to give their artists a percentage of all uh, their sales from the work that they were doing. That, that sounds great to me. You know, what a great incentive. Um, and this was, there, there were huge payouts like, Payouts of like $1,000 in 1936, 1936,000 dollars, which is you know adjusted for inflation, huge. This was this was really something special for these animators. And then uh, Snow White happened, and it was the Star Wars of the time, and not only critically acclaimed but hugely financially successful. And something happened; the bonuses just stopped. Um, and people were wondering, what about those extra hours that I worked? What about all that extra time? What about all the sweat? What about the promise? And they saw that, that, that they weren't getting these bonuses they were promised, but Walt was building a new studio in Burbank. And you know, as far as split down the middle goes, some of the people thought, oh, this is great. And some of the people thought, I can't pay my mortgage or support my family on this. So if you're looking for getting a job in the Great Depression or in like war-torn America, you know, Disney was a haven. But if you're just trying to just get your basic uh, expenses paid, they wanted this money that they were promised. And um, one of the documents that I had uncovered was the 1936 contract that Babbitt had at the Disney studio and the 1940 contract. And before and after Snow White, there, there's a four page difference. Everything else is exactly the same. And the four pages that are gone are the pages about adjusted bonuses, adjusted compensation, no more bonuses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Babbitt sued, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Babbitt sued Walt and um, he lost. He lost that, that suit. Um, and the evidence we now know off the top of our heads is that Fantasia and Pinocchio both lost money. At the time, they didn't know that. The public didn't know that both of them yeah. put Disney in the red. But the fact that we know that they both, each of them, lost a million dollars is due to this lawsuit. And that was the evidence that proves that Disney had no obligation to pay bonuses to anyone because they were so in the red.
Yeah, yeah. It's a, and also, you know, the other difference too with 1940 was World War II, which is, you know, America was neutral, but but Europe was was in flames. Asia was in flames. You know, and and uh, I, I think I was reading somewhere that by the end of 1940, uh, the only place a Disney movie could run in Europe was was Portugal and England. Wow, that was yeah. it dramatic loss to overseas uh, receipts yeah. from the films yeah. and that continued well past the war as well yeah. with, uh, you know, but it brought about the live action production mm -hmm. um, but it you know it also affected the ability to get materials um, it shifted things for women where men were going off to war to fight mm -hmm. and women were able to step into roles so it was it I think the timing of this strike comes at such an interest. You have to place it into the context of world events mm -hmm. and a, you know, a larger sense of, of social uh, upheavals that are happening, um, you know, not too dissimilar to where we are today. You know? mm -hmm. It's interesting. That's true. It's the fascinating yeah. parallels. Yeah. Um, what do you gentlemen feel? Uh, played a large part of uh, the impact that this has held on animation today, that this time period and the strike is still held on animation today. We talked earlier, you guys mentioned about uh, the importance of uh, examining this time period, but do we still see conflicts um, within the industry today that uh, have as much impact as this one particular event? Well, in my hometown of New York, we have an animation union representation for the first time in decades, right? For the first time, we have New York animators that are unionized. Not since, I think, the 1990s has this been a thing. And um, there's there's growth within Hollywood, too. Hollywood animators are now joining unions, right? I think, Tom, you might be able to speak to that. Um, I think, you know, it's really animators were the last craft in Hollywood at that time to have a union. And the Disney studio was the last studio within that craft mm -hmm. to accept the union. So once the Disney studio accepted the union, Hollywood now became a wall-to-wall -wall union town and all crafts could be represented. And I think it's interesting to look at that and see what was able to be done with just a group of people who fought and fought and fought for nine weeks. They used the tools that they had, which was the ability to draw funny animals. Mm -hmm. And with that, they won their cause. You know, take what you got and fly with it. Yeah, that's a lesson for today. Yeah. And you, you yeah. bring up a good point. I, and Tom, you can speak to this because my students are always surprised to learn. We certainly have heard of, heard of this fabled uh, and accounted for strike, but they're, they're surprised to learn that it, it was the last of a series of strikes until the, what, 1945 Warner Brothers strike. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about what preceded this strike and uh, in terms of the other studios and how those conflicts went. Yeah, well, just to say that, uh, yeah, the, the, the um, I, I mean, the Disney strike was at the end of a cycle that had basically engulfed all of Hollywood. And when I say Hollywood, I'm speaking, uh, you know, you know, as a category, you know, meaning the New York industries as well. It was all wrapped up in the same thing, which was which was when when Roosevelt signed the Wagner Act of 1940, uh, 1935, which which basically says uh, um, every person who who works has a right to collective bargaining, has a right to belong to a union. You can't fire somebody because they're part of a part of a union. Like the the Disney strike started because Walt fired Babbitt and the and and several other strike leaders which is illegal you know but but the laws were so new then and everything it was still kind of like a, a you know it hadn't quite sunk in they're like you can't do that and, and and so really between 35 and 41 that's when the writers guild got started the sag the actors guild the uh, the directors guild you know you, you know when the directors hollywood directors you think like wow there's a pampered group uh when they first said that they were going to unionize i think it was like david selsnick said what you, you put a picket line in front of my studio, I'll put a machine gun on the roof and mow you all down. Like, 
like, and that's like a really, you know, you know, really well thought of producer, but, but it, it's, it, it's that, it's that whole cycle of like, you know, it's not show art, it's show business, you know, and it's still about people being paid for, for what they do and wanting to be paid fairly for what they do. And I think what I love about watching Jake and, 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 you know, uh, younger generations uh, today is that I think they're a lot more economically savvy than, 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 than my generation was. I think they're, they're a lot more in tune to like, yeah, you, you know, we're being played by the system and you got to stick up for yourself. You can't just individually say, well, uh, well, I'm such a great artist. They're just going to pay me a lot of money anyway. Mm-hmm. Like uh, that, that, I, I wish it was true. You know, I mean, Rembrandt died broke, you know, Vermeer was broke, <laughs> Mozart. <laughs> you know, but it's many not just of our animators <laughs> still have absolutely with, with uh, yeah. low yeah. incomes at the end of their lives. But yeah. Um, you know, there were there was such a series of strikes leading up to this that Disney was the last uh, main holdout studio um, mm-hmm. before transitioning, and then of course the Warner Brothers strike in. Uh, 45, which actually got even more violent. Uh, yeah, that was like more of a citywide strike. That was like between two larger, larger unions, you know, two two groups yeah. and, and all. And and uh, and and the animators weren't as involved in that as uh, you know because they basically told the animators if you want to if you want to step back, it's okay because they had such a rough time organizing in 41. You know, so so some of them told me that they picketed, but a lot of them, you know, said, "Okay, well, you know." Well, we'll ironically, it. Betty Smith Totten was part of both. Uh, there's actual wow. photographs of her in both wow. strikes, which, wow. again, for a woman, uh, was pretty pretty unusual. But she was working there. She picked up work uh, after Disney. Uh, her husband then Bob was off fighting in the war, mm-hmm. and uh, was able to keep still keep the income coming in by uh, animating over at Warner Brothers and then going out on strike. Uh, but it was a you know water cannons called out and. Arrests. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it was a thing called the Battle of Warner Brothers. I think it's like October 5th, 1945, which is like 3,000 film workers fighting the Burbank police with like bats and chains and turning cars over. And it was like, (laughs) why do you think, because of all of these other strikes, why do you think we focus so much on the 1941 Disney strike? Well, if I can answer that, I think I think there are a couple of reasons. One is because they were successful. Two, it was nonviolent. Um, although there is one anecdote that was pulled out of Ward Kimball's diary. You'll see that in the book, where a couple of animators punched each other. Riley Thompson and Bill Pete got into a fist fight. Mm. But third, I think it's because the um, the guy who led it was like one of. Walt's closest collaborators at the time and had made like, he was really sacrificing it all and putting it all on the line on the line. Yeah. You go. You go. So, <laughs> so, so just to, just, Drawing just to wrap up, line. yeah, just to wrap up some final comments, like Jake, like what, what do you think would be like, like what's the message that you want people to take away from, 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 uh, from your book? Uh, this is, this is not really a book about animators. This is a book about marginalized underdogs who fought and won. Mm-hmm. The Disney stuff is just fun. That's true. That's true. Well, great, great. Well, well, I want to thank you, you know, for for your time and and thank you for the book and everything. It's a it, you know, it's a terrific read, and you know, and. and uh, like I said, you know, I wrote a book, but but like this, I'm learning a lot more stuff now and everything from reading yours. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, good luck with it. And, uh, uh, you know, what are you doing next? I can't tell you yet. I can't tell you, but I'm working on stuff. I'm, there's, there, there are irons in the fire. Good, good. Thanks for asking, though. Great. Thanks for asking. Yeah. And, and thank you, Tom, for only writing one chapter on the Disney stuff. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, when people are asking me about like, about like, well, isn't he doing the thing he already did? I go, I did my book 16 years ago. You could, there could be more books. I mean, how many, how many bios of Walt Disney are out there right now? <laughs> you know, you can fill a shelf with Walt Disney, but I mean, this subject is important enough, you know, to, to, you know, to be able to handle more than one, you know, one opinion. And uh, that's great. You know, more power to you. So, thanks. Yeah, yeah, Mindy. Okay, what? With important you, work and yeah. and an important subject that uh, we're excited to learn more about. As I always say, the truth uh, is constant, but what we know about the truth changes. So we're grateful for both of you for your work, and mm -hmm. for uh, keeping us ever forward with uh, this important subject that still is resonant today. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Take care. Okay. Bye bye now.